All right, so jQuery Mobile, um, hopefully you're seeing that it could be very, very valuable. Uh, this is one of many projects out there that is trying to accomplish the same thing. How do we create an interface very quickly without having to write it from the beginning, from zero every time? Uh, we'll also talk about other competitors later. But I like to show this one early on to show that very quickly we can create an interesting and useful interface pretty easily. Let's set ourselves up that instead of a simple button to go from page one or page two, let's set up a more full-featured navigation system, a navigation bar. Oftentimes at the top of an app, you have the different buttons of the different screens you can go to. So uh, up on this home area, PG Home, uh, we're going to set up a navigation bar. So let's go back to find your section, PG Home and in the header. So the idea of what should go in the header is stuff at the very top of the document. Makes sense. And at the moment it says home, so we'll add something new inside of header of PG home. Now as we get more complex like this, and at the moment this is, this is not complex yet, it's two screens, but it is complex in the sense that we've got sections and headers and articles and all of that. So you just need to kind of get practice and memorize. And you know, the weekend is coming up. I hope that you practice what we did here. And we'll look at jQuery Mobile. And I hope you keep practicing this. There's no homework yet. Unofficial homework will be to look at jQueryMobile.com. <coughs> will be to look at jQueryMobile.com. We'll, we'll get to that a little later. There will be homework, of course, things that you need to turn in to show your progress, but not just yet. So I hope that you take the weekend to practice this a little bit more, because we are going to use jQuery Mobile a lot. And as you're seeing here, this is a way to quickly create an interface. There's still plenty more to learn. For example, let's create a brand new tag over here called nav. Nav for navigation. So here we can have create a nav bar. This one's a little more complex in that we said, OK, here's a header data roll header, and then the stuff is inside of it. Here's a button, data roll button, it's a button. Navbar is a little more complex. We have to use two different tags. One is the navbar that delineates, one is nav, which delineates it's a navbar. But the actual individual buttons come from an unordered list via an unordered list. And that's the fancy way of saying bullet points. Out of plain old bullet points, we're going to upgrade them to be like a real navbar. So first, navbar attribute data role. Navbar. So we're saying what's going to be inside of this tag will be a navigation bar. Links at the top of the screen. They will be at the top of the screen because it's inside of header. Each individual button, however, will be a bullet point. So we have a tag called UL. That's an L, not a 1. UL, unordered list. And that's the fancy way of saying bullet points. So UL, unordered list. Start the bullet points on ordered list. Each individual item in the list is its own line and its own link, um, its own clickable button. So we have li, which is list item, opening and closing list item. This is going to be one bullet point. The first link that I want is home. The second link that I want, the second bullet point, the second button in my nav bar will be about. Let's say eventually we also want a third screen list item contact. So my app is going to have a home about contact and other screens. And also, what we're doing today is 
is the main purpose of kind of learning jQuery mobile. We're not going to continue with this when we make our app for real eventually. This is just some practice. Uh, so if, it, if these aren't the screens that we would have for the CBDB app, that, that's fine. This is practice. Uh, but here, what I'm trying to do is create a nav bar. And uh, when, we, when we see the results in the browser, it's not quite there yet, because like I said, it needs a little more setup. But what we've got so far is up in the head section, we've got this nav with a data roll nav bar and these three bullet points. Well, the bullet points have changed. If we didn't have nav bar, let's say I break that, I write, I write nav bars, that doesn't exist, that's not valid, what I would get is bullet points. So unordered lists and bullet points are plain old HTML that has, invent, that has existed since 1989, you know, almost 30 years ago. Well, with jQuery Mobile, invented I think around 2010, 2012 or something, uh, we have ways to then upgrade the basic code. So we notice that when I misspelled this deliberately, it broke it because it doesn't know what is navbars. We know what navbar is, but not navbars. And so it, we see the basic. Okay, navbar. And what it did was it took away the bullet point and it made it one line. Uh, I want these to then be clickable so that they go to the other screens. Making them clickable requires the A tag, the plain A link tag. So we're going to wrap A tags around each of these. So each list item, each bullet point in my bullet point list in my nav bar will have an A tag, will have a link, so that when you click one, it goes to the next screen. This needs at least one attribute for a link to work. What is the required attribute for a link to work? href, href. The home button should take us to the home screen. Pound PG home. The about uh, bullet point needs an href that will take us to pound PG about. And then the contact bullet point will have an href of PG contact, which does not exist at the moment. That's OK. We'll need to create it later. But I know here I want to have three buttons at the top of the screen, home, about, and contact, to take me to those screens, home, about, and contact. And each of those screens is a section. And each of these sections has an ID. And each ID has to be unique. And we're using the naming convention PGX. PG home, PG about, PG contact. Running that, <clears throat> now then looks getting there still. Now they're properly centered and divided amongst themselves. And now they've got little rollovers. So uh, don't add this one, but we can add more and we can say uh, email. So don't add another one. But we, as we add more, they automatically spread themselves out, center themselves. You know, if you've got a wider screen like this, they take up x amount of space. Smaller screen, they take up less space. At a certain point, you know, they grow and shrink because several things are in play. Again, uh, I didn't really need email. I'm just showing you that we can do another one. We can do I don't know eight buttons if you want up there. Although at a certain point, it's too many. If you look at the icons of the apps that you use on a regular basis, you often have two or three, maybe four. They don't, they don't really weigh it down with so many clickable links at the top. Maybe you click one and, and, a, and a special side panel appears, or maybe you click and a pop-up appears, or another sub-menu. We can do that, of course. We will do that. But we can uh, simply get started with a plain old bullet point list, an unordered list of list items inside of a nav element inside of a nav tag 
with a data role attribute properly linked, and jQuery Mobile does the rest. Sing, uh, separates it, aligns it, rollover effect, etc. Because previously we, we figured out a way, or I told you a way to um, add icons, add icons to a button, that is valid here as well. We don't have to say data role button because it assumes whatever link inside of a list item, inside of an unordered list, inside of a nav bar must be a button. We don't have to explicitly say data role equals button. But there's no icon. So see if you remember how to add icons. Add a different icon for those three different buttons. We have a home icon for, for home. About, I don't know, maybe you can use star. Contact, we have mail, M-A-I-L. Maybe later on we'll look up the website to see all the possible list of icons. But try for a moment, Ch put icons right there. We've already learned how over here. So try to put icons on those three buttons. So in most languages, when you when you learn this base, these basic concepts, it's like pieces of a puzzle, or uh, you know ingredients in a recipe. If you if you have you know onions, celery, and carrots, you can make so many kinds of dishes with those from all over the world in every every culture. You start with those same three ingredients. And you know, Mexican cuisine will give you one result. Italian cuisine will give you another result. Persian cuisine will give you another result. Every culture with the same ingredients, you make different results. So jQuery Mobile, they have the ingredients. We have these pieces. I want to I wanna make a button. Oh, well, here's the code. I want to make an animation. Here's the code. But we then take those ingredients to make a web project, a website, or a mobile app. And so if I know that I can add data-icon equal to home, data-icon star, no, actually I'll, I want to do info. That's the one I was thinking of. And then data-icon mail. then I would get the icons. The default, these icons went above the text. We have a way to move them to the left of the text, to the right of the text, to the bottom of the text. Let's say at the moment, I, I wouldn't quite tell you that yet, so I would go look it up. And we're going to go look up all of this in, in just a little bit. But here now I've got um, my home screen, home, about, contact, rollovers with icons. I click about, goes to the about screen. No navigation here because I never programmed it here. I have to go back. I'm on the home screen. Well, clicking home, I'm already on home. Clicking contact, there's no contact. Depending on the web browser, it may do nothing or it may give you an error. There's no contact page. So we have different things to do here. Add the nav bar consistently to our screens, and then maybe add a third screen. But before that, um, the default animation is in effect again, fade. So if we've got href data icon data transition. Flip there. I'm going to do a slide here. I'm going to do 
flow there. So now each one of those three buttons has a different animation. I'll mention two things here, one frivolous and one less frivolous. As we write our code, we've seen HTML and CSS and JavaScript code. And we see that we can write it as, as we wish in terms of tabs and indents and enters and all of that. And something that is sort of interesting to teach people is also style, the style that you write your code, and this is completely personal choice. I've written these three lines of code, and they work. But perhaps I might write them instead like this. I tabbed these attributes so that this lines up really nice, and this lines up Really nice. <coughs> that is completely for aesthetics. It's not important for the code to work. But looking at it then from a distance like that, it's a little more readable, maybe. When the lines are, when all of the attributes are right next to each other, it's a little harder to then pick out what's the attribute I'm, I'm looking for. Tabbing them like this and making these visual columns. I can kind of then hone in and look at the code a little better. Uh, there, there quite aren't other instances where I could do that just yet. There were several instances where we could have done that in JavaScript. I didn't want to bring it up at that point just yet. But this is one of these completely optional, completely frivolous, completely aesthetic, completely valuable things that you could think about when you write your code, even simply tabbing these things. In other languages, alignments and tabs and spaces do matter, uh, but not in JavaScript. But what's useful about doing it in JavaScript is just for aesthetics. And as you're reading your dozens and then hundreds and then thousands of lines of code, having it aesthetically nice is also useful for you debugging it and troubleshooting it. And you know, if you're doing this properly all the time and then suddenly uh, you know, my code doesn't work, what's going on? And as you debug it, oh, this stands out, why is that purple? And this is black, oh, I see I didn't end my quote right there. Well, when these are lined up and you expect these things to be a certain way, that is one way to help a little bit with the debugging. And obviously I'm not going to force any sort of uh, way to do this. I'm often going to do things in the, in some way like this because I like it. I think it's been useful to me. Uh, it, this is exactly the same as if I didn't have any tabs, but I think for uh, for debugging, for aesthetics, I think that's good. Uh, there's you know there, there's philosophies. Uh, beautiful code is good code. So it's not just that the code works. Is that if it looks nice on screen too, it's good for you. It's good for other people working on your team. If you're working with other people and everyone's code is all, you know, a mishmash, it's hard to read, hard to understand, hard to debug, hard to troubleshoot. Even things like alignments and tabs and comments and stuff like that really helps in that regard. All of that was just sort of a one one point I wanted to make. To think about. The other point that I do want you to think about more seriously though is what I've got here. I've got three transitions. That's actually bad. It works if I click the buttons, they go from screen to screen. But that's bad for user experience. That's bad for interface design. If you look, if you think about really the apps that you use on a regular basis, you know that when you click on an icon and if something happens a certain way, it has a certain meaning. When I click the button and something slides up, that tells me, oh, I need to write a message. If I click on something and something maybe pops into view, oh, that's a warning. We may not know these things consciously, but in decades of web and app design, there are common conventions. Even subtle things like this. 
here's something where it could be more obvious. If I'm going to have a button called home, you don't often see it with a star icon. You see it with an icon of a house. If you have a save button, we've got it right here in Notepad++. Um, you know, maybe some of us have never seen these or haven't seen them in a long time. What is that thing right there? What is that physical thing? It's a floppy disk, a thing that's been extinct for a while, but it used to rule the earth. It's a floppy disk. You can't even buy them anymore. Well, maybe in fries in the back somewhere. But that means save. So that has a meaning that has evolved over 30, 40, 50 years of computers. So transitions in animations, just because I can put three different animations, I should not. I, I'm doing a lot of things wrong here. I'm confusing the person. And again, it's not that our users are dumb. It's just that we personally have an idea of what this app does and how it works and what, and what it's, how it runs. But then when you give it to someone to use for the first time, they have to learn your app. And if your icon for home is something besides a house, OK, that's half a millisecond that they then get confused, they figure it out. But then as you have more of these inconsistencies and more of these odd choices or such, your app gets less and less fun to use, less interesting. And why would I use your app? There's 20 different versions that I could download instead. So even something as simple as your, as your animation from screen to screen is important. So I did it on purpose to show that it's a little chaotic right here. If I were to go from screen to screen, well, this screen is going to do that animation. And then clicking on that screen, we'll do another kind of animation, and another one, and another one. You don't have this language of what your app does. So again, objectively looking at, if you've got an iPhone, your animations are a certain way. If you've got an Android, your animations and colors are a certain way. There's all of that aesthetic quality to an app. And we'll be covering it several, way, several times as the course goes on. But just very simply here, I would not have three different animations here. Just because I can add seven fonts to my resume, should I? No, I should have that one main font for headings and maybe another font for main text. Just because I can add a cool font in my signature and up on the title and then on, this, on the education, no, that doesn't look professional. Maybe you know that. Maybe you know it consciously or subconsciously. You were taught that in you know, writing in a document. Don't use seven fonts. You have 700 on your computer. Pick two at the most. We have six different animations. <clears throat> pick one. Pick two. Pick an animation that makes sense. Later on, we're going to do pop-ups. I want to click a screen to pop up. That's an animation. So I would only assume to use, and you can play with it right now if you want to see it, it's called pop. I would use pop only for pop-ups. Right now, if I put it on a non-pop-up, it's going to confuse people. Like, hey, that looked like a pop-up. What did I miss? The design language of pop-ups, of websites and apps and such, has been set for 20, 30, 50 years. We shouldn't go against it. It may sometimes work, but... Uh, you know, I teach a social media class, and I cover all the social networks, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and so forth. And 95% of them function very, very similarly. The one that really broke the rules a lot was Snapchat, where there were no icons labeled. You had to know, swipe down to do X, swipe left to do that. There was no indication even that you could swipe. Only, you know, the cool kids that are trying to get away from the social network that their parents are on are going to use this app that is suddenly different than the rest because I'm going to have the time to figure it out without reading a manual. They broke all the rules and they got a fan base and a user base and Snapchat kind of did it right, uh, doing it wrong. But, you know, Facebook is not going to suddenly with its huge user base of ages 13 to 130 is not going to suddenly change the way they work so radically that I'm lost. So even something like transitions matter because then here that popped into view which should have been an animation reserved for a real pop-up. I click a button here to send an email and then a little pop-up screen appears to send an email. That's just something we'll think about and apply as more time goes on.
So if I added my nav bar successfully on my home screen, there's no nav bar in my about screen. So again, a copy and paste will be very useful. You, of course, want to copy and paste if it works properly. You don't want to copy code that doesn't work. I, I wrote an, an X there instead of an A. So when I copied it and pasted it to seven screens, seven errors. So I'll copy the nav bar and paste it into PG about. So now PG about has the same consistency of where these links go. Icons are the same. Actually, I didn't want star, but I'll fix that. And then same animation. The the animation that I've chosen. Of flip, I'm using it in more than one of these buttons. I'm keeping it consistent to set up a design language and aesthetic for my app. That normal navigation from screen to screen is a plain old flip. If then the transition is suddenly different, that's also a conscious and subconscious cue to my user something's different. Have you been to websites where suddenly just pop-ups are appearing? You click OK, close it. Another pop-up, just close it. Don't even pay attention. Then one of those pop-ups had something very important and you didn't even read it because you were just used to clicking close. Same thing here with our apps. We've got a certain animation happening for a certain action, which is simply navigating screen to screen. But let's say this was going to be a button about post a message. So then we have it pop up in a different animation with a different color or something to uh, get people's attention. So we've got a home screen, an about screen. We've got a button for contact screen, but we have no contact screen. So here's what your challenge will be for a couple of minutes. Create the third screen. We've got enough knowledge so far for you to create it either from scratch or copy and paste. But here's what we're going to do. A little quick in-class mini, mini assignment. Create the third screen and raise your hand to show me. Call me over when you've created the contact screen. I need to be, you need to be able to click on contact and I see a contact screen. Put, a, put whatever you want on it, but call me over when you've done it. Figure out how to create a third screen. We've already done one screen and two screens together. Now you try your third screen. <clears throat> Let me show off some of the back row already got it done.
thinking about what we did on Tuesday, and instead of replicating the header and the footer portion, would I use JavaScript with the inner HTML to just create it once and plug it in? Okay. Basically. Uh, that's what I was saying earlier, that right now it's very basic, but using the interactive JavaScript dynamic, we can change that. Cool. Okay. Thanks. This is the, this was your little challenge, if you didn't quite get it to work, uh, I'll do it right now. Uh, but this is what you need to do when we're outside of class, right? All right, everyone, I'm going to go on, please. <clears throat> so if um, you got your first two working, it's going to be very similar to get the third one working, because you've already got a section with a header and all of that stuff. So it's just a big copy and paste, and then changing the details, maybe. So I'm just going to copy my section. So guys, right there, if you could keep it down just a little bit. Sophia, a little lower, please. So if we copy that section, and then we paste the next section, and then, well, I need to change this section here because it's now no longer in home. And this, more importantly, this ID is no longer PG Home, it's PG uh, Contact. And then so Home becomes Contact. And you can change any of this other stuff main contact, main content for contact, etc. So it was a simple copy and paste. Now I've got a third screen. Contact. Main content for contact. And then home. So all that we've been doing here has been the tip of the iceberg of jQuery Mobile. Let's take a little moment to see, well, what else can we do with jQuery Mobile? As I said, we can make a grid layout. We have these other sorts of elements like 
pop-ups and side panels and all this great stuff. So I'm going to go to the web browser and let's go to the home page of jQuery Mobile. Let's go to jQueryMobile.com. jQueryMobile.com. A touch-based, a touch-optimized web framework. jQuery Mobile is an HTML5-based user interface system designed to make responsive websites and apps that are accessible on all smartphone, tablet, and desktop devices. So um, this project, like I said, it's a it's a free project. It's um, it's open source. Um, there's a team all over the world working on it and improving it, making it better. We're using version 145. Version 150 will come out, and then 16 or whatever. New versions will come out with new features. So the way we would use the this website is we have. Uh, demos or API documentation. The much more hardcore uh, programmer um, documentation is the API documentation. We, we don't usually do too much there unless we're doing really advanced things. So you can look at API documentation later. It's often very much more useful to go to demos because they give you a preview of what the code looks like and then the code. Whereas the API documentation is a lot more wordy and it says, well, here's your possible parameters and here's your event handlers and all of this, but not exactly perhaps a, a visual representation of what it is. So here in jQuery Mobile, let's click on demos. We need to look at uh, the proper version that we're using in our project. Which version are we using in our project? 145. When we typed our code at the beginning of the day, we had it linked to jQuery 145. So click on that one, latest stable version. On the left side or on the bottom table of contents, we have all of these possible things of what we can we, what we can do. If you scroll down on the table of contents over here, uh, I'm curious over here under CSS framework icons. So here we will see the full list of all built-in icons and how we can create our own icons. So let's look at this for a moment. Under CSS, click on Icons. A set of built-in icons in jQuery Mobile can be applied to buttons, collapsible elements, list view buttons, and more. There's an SVG and a ping image of each icon. By default, the SVG icon that looks great on both standard def and high def screens are used. On platforms that don't support SVG, the framework falls back to ping icons. So there's a high quality version in SVG, and if the device doesn't understand it, it falls back to PNG, another format. So the icon set, basically it says, in widgets where you set the icon with a data icon attribute, you use the name of the icon as the value. So data icon equals something. We also have other ways using uh, classes. Uh, so in some ways we add data icon and then the icon. In other ways we use classes, CSS classes, and we would write ui-icon-arrow-r. We'll see the difference when, when we need to care about the difference. But notice then, okay, so simply data role equals I mean, data icon equals action gives you this icon here, this sort of action button, which is often very useful, like you want to share something elsewhere, like share it off on social media or something. We've got an alert icon, so a little warning thing. There's the different arrows. We can even do arrows at diagonals. So that's arrow DL, down, left. A little audio icon. Obviously, that doesn't do anything until you program it to be interactive with JavaScript, but we get an icon for a speaker. And this is when we get into the point again of user experience and user interface design. This 
looks like a camera, and therefore we should use it for purposes related to imagery. It would make no sense to use that icon if you're going to send someone an email. Obviously, that, that's a, take, take them a photo and then send an email. You don't want to confuse your users. So a lot of these have a built-in meaning. You know, if I, if I don't tell you what it is on the right there, what is this thing? It is obviously at the bottom of a posting cut out like this. So you can pull off the phone number and call someone to buy a couch. Right? No, it is a calendar. What I'm saying is that different people might interpret these things in different ways. Uh, let me see here. So, what is what is this one right here? It's a cloud. So, great, I'm going to go look at a gallery of clouds that this person took photos of. You know, it probably means related to cloud services like online storage or something. Oh, here, I'm going to click here to read comic books. Well, they call it comment. So, some of these icons have been very obvious throughout the decades of usage of what they are, like this heart nowadays. Well, that's to give a like, to check info. What is this one here? Maybe some kind of map. Directions, location. Because then we've got another one over here related to maps as well. Navigation or get directions or something. This one over here looks like a stop or some kind of like warning traffic sign. Well, it's just a simple minus sign. So that might be like plus or minus to add or subtract something. But it almost also looks like that, uh, what is that, like the railway crossing sign or something? What's that one traffic sign that you see that does have a white bar across it with a red circle? Wrong way? Wrong way? Yeah. So, okay, don't click this. You're going to go the wrong way. So some of these have an obvious meaning and some of them don't. And part of user experience design is, um, you know, don't confuse the user. We've got this one, which looks like a really, really, really old camera. It's video. But I would probably maybe even use camera to delineate or designate uh, recording video. Or maybe I don't like this icon at all. It looks so abstract. It does look like a really old classic kind of camera icon. So if I don't like icon these built in, there's 50 of them. It doesn't have every single one. So I can make my own icons. There's no skull icon at the moment. You know, uh, click here to exit the game or something. It doesn't have a built in meaning perhaps. But the way the documentation works is if it doesn't obviously tell you what to do, you're going to see something that says view source. Let's scroll down here to custom icons and click view source. It kind of explains in general how it works. You might see an example, but then you often see view source. I have something to do in HTML and something to do in CSS. In HTML, for example, I can create a button. So we do have a button tag. We were using hrefs. But another way is button class UI-button, UI-shadow, UI-corner, all, UI-button icon left, UI-icon, my icon. So this is when you want to create your own icons and be more complex. Well, data role equals button might not be enough because you're going beyond the basics. So here there's a class, a CSS class, that is saying, let's activate a button. Let's give it a shadow. Let's make all the corners round. Let's put the icon to the left. So all of this, basically, all of this highlighted, all of that comes automatically from data role equals button. But sometimes we need to write things in a very sort of specific, low level way, because maybe I don't actually want drop shadows on my button. So. I say, no drop shadow. Maybe I don't want the corners rounded in my button, so remove that part. So the built-in data role equals button will give you rounded buttons with drop shadows. I don't want that, so I have to kind of customize it by a class. I also don't want one of the built-in icons. So we have uicon-icon-myicon. They should have been more obvious and called it skull. 
UI-icon-skull. So I'm going to create my own skull icon. Well, that's half of what I would need to do. I would then need to also write some CSS. UI-icon my icon, which again, that should have been just for more obviousness in the tutorial. UI-icon-skull, UI colon after. And then a link to my particular skull icon plus its size and such. So of course there's a way to customize it to be my own icons, my own colors. jQuery Mobile is a very good starting point, but of course there's a way to make it better, improve it, uh, or customize it. And oftentimes it's a little bit more effort than just simply data roll equals whatever. I have to customize it a bit more. So we're not going to do custom icons at the moment. They take a little more setup than we have time for but we can do custom icons. There's positioning. Data icon POS, position. Data icon POS set to right, top, or bottom will then change the position of the icon. If in your nav bar you don't like that your icons are at the top, which is the default, we then set data icon POS equals bottom, and the icon should go below your text. Checking view source. Or it tells you here, data icon pos attribute. So we have, you don't have to do this, but I've got data icon home, data transition flip, data icon pos, position, bottom. I have to set all four of them, all three of them. But we have these ways to customize the, um, the different default values of jQuery mobile. We have this other way as well. I only want the text. I'm sorry, I only want the icon, not the text. View source. This is a different way to change the customization. We can also use no text as a value for icon pass if you want to create an icon only button. So at the very least, we have the list of all the 50 icons. We have eventually a way that we will see on how to customize our icons. For the last thing that I want to do before we get to the end of the lecture, I want to add another sort of element. They call them here widgets. I want to add another element in our project, let's say, in the About screen instead of this button. It doesn't really matter to us anymore. I want to create a list view item. Uh, from the left, you may see there list view widget. We have these different kinds of list views. Just click on the first one. Let's look at list view, list view. A list view is coded as a simple unordered list or ordered list with a data role list view and has widget range of features. Okay, so a very simple list like this, list of items, view source. We're going to do this in a moment. An unordered list with a data role of list view, list items. That's easy. OK. Another one that we can do, items that are linked or items that are inset. So a list of options in our app. Click here to do this. Click here to do that. <coughs> so this looks nicely designed, all connected together, rollovers with an icon to go somewhere the source on this one unordered list so bullet points data role list view data inset true and then list items bullet points with an href pointing somewhere and the result is this sort of clickable list of links 
or options. You can get a pretty cool one over here, filter. We have a bunch of items that are possibly selectable for the person. Well, we have a built-in little search thing where a person starts to add a certain search term, and then it filters itself to only show those. We've got the opposite. We've got a search where based on what they start to type, things will get revealed. View source, a little bit more setup. Data role, list view, data filter, true. Data filter, reveal, true. Data input, autocomplete input, data inset, true. And then over here, there's a little form, a simple form, input, class, UI filterable, <coughs> an ID, which is the same as this one here. So more setup, but here's a way for us to filter a list via JavaScript as we create this database of comics and we want to search our list of comics we could do something like this where the JavaScript can pull a list of all of the all of the uh, names of the superheroes and then a person starts typing you know spider-man and it'll appear there spider-man spider-woman spider-ham uh, spider-gwen you know all of the spider characters uh, and it would search to the list of your uh, of your data. Here's something cool as well. Here's a mail and our inbox and our contacts. We can create that as well. Dividers. No, the way that you work on it or use it is because inside of your HTML file you have the link to those websites and then it works. Later on, we will download those files because right now our project, uh, these webs this website, assumes you have an internet connection. So if our internet connection breaks, then, uh, then our project breaks. Later, we will download the software so that it's inside of our folder, and then we don't need an internet connection. But as long as we have link here and then the script at the end, then we have access to it. So inside of the uh, inside of the uh, about screen, I want to make a simple list view. Uh, so let's find our section of PG about. Inside of PG About, I no longer want this really simple button here. Uh, you can just delete it or comment it out. Maybe move that comment down over here. So this used to be a comment and it was ending right here. I moved the ending comment right there so that that gets deactivated. We need an unordered list, bullet points, data role, list view, data inset, true, and then each list item, each bullet point. On about, maybe I have here the list of the of the of the software <clears throat> that my app is made in so I'm gonna list HTML CSS JavaScript that one right there so plain old bullet points that are then upgraded into something very visually interesting and user-friendly if I didn't have the data role or if I have it misspelled bullet points plain old bullet points 
with the proper data roles or attributes. Looks like that with uh, the, the design built in. So with, um, with this, actually, I thought, OK, uh, there's going to be the basic aspect of the app and the advanced aspect of the app. So I want to display them in a way with dividers. I want to use dividers. So dividers are data, div data role list divider. OK, so I want to say basic. Tools or basic code or something, and then advanced. So the HTML and the CSS are going to be under a heading of basic, and then JavaScript under advanced. And then uh, this particular list item needs an extra <coughs> attribute to make it behave like a heading, which is uh, data role list divider. This is one of the ones that, for some reason, they put a dash in it. Not very many of them have dashes. I think um, there's a little inconsistency there. They don't have dashes on most of these list view. No dash, but list divider has a dash. And now advanced, I also want a data role list divider. And the result of that is that I've got a list of the basic tools of my app and the advanced tools. If I want a person to click on JavaScript to tell me more, that's a plain old link. A tag. href, maybe I could do pg javascript. I'm not going to create the screen at the moment, but the idea is that I'm pointing it to some section with an ID of pg javascript. And now what automatically happens is that's a clickable link. I get the icon, which also shows it's going to go somewhere. It won't actually go anywhere yet. I haven't made the screen. But plain old bullet points then get upgraded to something visually interesting. And again, uh, jQuery or many of these other sorts of libraries are like ingredients in a recipe. And you, everyone takes the same 10 ingredients, and everyone makes their own meal out of it. Uh, your particular app might not need a list view element or a, or a list view widget, but when you do, there's something available. And it can be customized, the size and the icon and all of that. I would read the documentation. What else? How else can I change it? But I think uh, for the moment, spending today on the ideas of an interface design, was useful because the, the little project we created yesterday was a big focus on JavaScript and we, the way we write JavaScript and such. And this one was a focus on HTML. We're going to combine the two, of course, JavaScript plus HTML plus CSS. But here, very quickly, we can create an interface for an app. There's no functionality yet except going from screen to screen. But eventually, this will have a login screen, a logout screen, display a list in my database, save a new item to the database, pop up screen to send a message to the developer, take a photo of the item. So we're starting with plain old HTML, upgrading it, then getting into JavaScript, and then eventually taking all of that core of the web project and then upgrading that to be an app. That's going to be in part two. 
Once we get the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in part one, in part two we'll then focus on upgrading that to a real app. Part two is when you're going to need a device. Remember I have ten tablets that I could loan out during class. If you want to bring your own device, that's good. Uh, it has to be an Android device. It could be a uh, phone or a tablet and try to get an Android device with at least Android 4.0 or higher. And I'll remind us at time, as time goes on. But Android device, 4.0, and you're going to need your cable. That's going to be in part two in, what, two or three weeks? So, of course, I'll remind us. But we're still going to work with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in part one. In part one, we're also, of course, of course, going to talk about, probably on Tuesday, we'll start to think in terms about, OK, if I'm getting these pieces of a puzzle or these ingredients in a recipe, I need a plan. What's, what's my recipe? What's my app? So we're going to spend time on wireframing and storyboarding and brainstorming on an app and its functionality. Because I may be an expert in all of this code, but if I don't have an idea of what I'm trying to do, the app might not turn out how I expect. So we're going to do a little, we'll step back and we'll do a little planning of the app. And then, of course, keep going and keep coding. As we can see, uh, we already scared off like six people uh, from the class. And, uh, you know, no, I won't take it bad if you uh, come back some other semester. If you didn't quite like the class or whatever, that's fine. Uh, and we're going to keep going and we're going to uh, keep learning this stuff. So I'm going to end the main lecture, but general questions on what we've talked about today? Okay, so...